Hey guys, and thanks so much for tuning in to this week's edition of the Original Strength Podcast. I've got my good friend Andrew Hutchinson back with me today, and we're going to be talking about as in mind, so in body. Or is it as in body, so in mind? It's the first yeah. way, right? The latter, but it doesn't really matter because it's both, isn't it? The latter, as in body, so in mind. All right. Well, Andrew, thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me back. All right. Um, so I, I messed that up, and you said it was the latter. You said it was as in body, so in mind. Yeah, although it's like everything, it's a closed loop, isn't it? But we're we're taking the as in body in mind approach. Okay. So we're so, we're working with the low hanging fruit, aren't we, to to create the changes? Oh, I, I got it. So you're affecting working with the body to affect the changes in the mind. Yeah. All right. So cool. How does that work? <laughs> Simple. Change change the composition, the structure, the performance of. The physical matter that we inhabit, your soul, consciousness, whatever you want to call it, inhabits, and you change the way you perceive the world. And there are very close correlations between specific regions of the body and specific, I can't think of the word I'm looking for. So whether we talk strength, agility, whatever, stability, there is a direct correlation between having stability in the body and having stability in the mind. So, you know, if we talked about being stable, for example, example, and the muscles that we engage and the changes that we cause structurally and therefore chemically and physically and energetically. If you start doing balancing work, whether that be balancing on one leg, whether that be walking along a two by four with a couple of heavy kettlebells, you engage certain muscles. As we know, there are lots of muscles involved. It's all connected, as we know. But there's a lot of stuff going on, particularly in the pelvic floor region and the top of the thighs um, around there, the lower back. And that region is known to create stability. You know, if we if we talk about the, the whole idea of the chakras, the, the root chakra, I mean, there is technically, there's, well, there's hundreds, but there's, if we talk about the, the initial seven or nine, there's one kind of down by the feet. But then there's the one in, in the root, which is in the kind of pelvic floor region. That creates stability for the rest of them. And it's well known that without that stability there, you're basically building a house on really dodgy foundations. When you work with that region, it changes the way energy flows around your body. You know, we can talk about the microcosmic orbit, you know, the, the way the energy flows around that. Or we can talk about sim simple chemical changes, you know, whether that be myokine, cytokines from within the muscles or the actual you know, physical expression of how we move, how, how, we, how we change our chemistry. When you create stability in that region, you are more stable of mind. Because you perceive things differently through the energetic and chemical changes that happen when you create more stability there. And that, that, same, that same thing applies throughout the entire system. And the, the, the big one that's come up for me lately, which I've, I've toyed with quite a bit, but I haven't really said anything about it until I was sure that the correlation was such through personal experience because as you know you know we can study these things till the cows come home and and we can see patterns but until you've truly experienced that change physically that you were expecting from that and yeah we could say the expectation creates it but there's definitely a link there is has been to do with the kind of the gracilis primarily um which is known as the love muscle um there's another name for it. And its function, as you will know, is largely to help perform the, the kind of thrust, if you like, of the pelvic region forward. Um, for want of a better explanation, that's that's one of kind of primary function. So almost our the thrusting out of the center of our body, the part that we would thrust forward during love making. So, you know, the love muscle, hen I think that's where it gets its name from. Well, I believe so. And when you think about, because sitting in chairs has, has long been something that I, I felt is not given enough credit for the damage it causes, if we like. That's not the nicest way of putting it, but it, it is probably the worst thing that we do as a species um, for our, our health, our well-being, our spiritual well-being. Because we can talk about all the ways in which it you know, kind of um, switches off, deactivates muscles in the way that we sit in that position, supported by a chair. But the, the really big one for me is the impact it has on that. It's the exact opposite of thrusting through, of expressing. You know, if we talk about an opening up of us 
as a, a spiritual, a physical being. It is a literal opening up of the body. And we see this when we talk about, you know, hunched shoulders, when we talk about, you know, the body being kind of closed in, this six pointed star that we are kind of all hunched in, that comes with a certain energy and chemistry. And when we expand and we kind of open up, you know, people will feel that when you do the, the, the power pose, you know, you stand with your hands on your hips and you, and you push forward a little bit. It's known to increase testosterone levels significantly and so on and so forth. Um, and sitting is the anti that. So sitting is literally, it's switching off everything. And it's also, you'll feel it. If you sit down in a chair, the next time you sit in a chair, feel exactly the, the, the region in which it impacts the most in terms of it literally just turns it straight off, just turns it to mush. And it's that area around the adductors, but particularly right back there in the gracilis, leading into the kind of the inside of the, the lower glutes almost, that kind of region. So literally by sitting down, we are becoming less loving. Um, we're, we're losing our lust for life, um, our love for life, and we are literally becoming less loving at a chemical level. And it sounds like quite a big claim, I know, but I believe it 100% having experimented with it and having really felt the difference in, in a couple of weeks. It's just been astounding. Um, so, yeah, I shall stop talking at that point. So, well, there's a lot in there to try to unpack, but so. You're saying sitting turns off the muscles uh, around the pelvic floor or inside the thighs, the adductors, and the, the hip flexors area, yeah. the, the gracilis. Yeah. And, and, that muscle, and, and, and that muscle, also called the love muscle, yeah. if it's doing functioning properly, yeah. a person feels more loving and or or just better, or like, how does that work? If, if you imagine that when you are, let's, a really simple way of looking at it would be if you imagine the freeze response, which is kind of basically known as curling up into a ball to protect oneself. When, when you sit down in a chair, you, you kind of do that. It's different because certain stuff's deactivated by the fact you're supported in that position, but you effectively curl up into a ball um everything's kind of squeezed into that area if you sit in a chair now you'll find that everything kind of gets squeezed into that area yeah um the kind of the thighs come together the everything i'm trying to think of the best way to explain it um but rather than being if you if you stand up and bring your shoulders back and put your hands on your hips and bring your pelvis forward it feels very very different energetically and chemically and you notice that within a couple of minutes and it's been seen chemically the changes from when you sit down and you basically curl up. So we're going from one position is this, one position is that. Yeah. Now, obviously, if you sit down and you had your shoulders back and you do this and you push yourself up in your chair and you thrust yourself forward, it's different. But when you sit in a chair and allow all of that pelvic floor region basically to turn off, because it's not having to do anything. If you sit in a squat or you sit cross-legged on the floor, it's still active. It's still switched on in a certain way. It's, it's you know, we're, we're sitting according to our design you know whether that be squatting in a resting position whether it be sitting on the floor cross-legged you can feel the difference by doing it I and mean, i'm sat cross-legged on the floor now and if you sit down like that and you shuffle around a bit you, you can feel even have a poke around there with your hands there's it's relaxed but it feels alive if that makes any sense it still feels on it doesn't feel like it's completely been deactivated because it's not been it's just not been switched off in the way that things do in a chair. I'm probably not the best person to explain that because I'm explaining it from a maybe an oversimplistic and feel it point of view. Well, I mean, like, I think sitting is like the adult. I mean, if an adult spends their life in a chair in the sitting position, it's kind of like always being in the fetus position or yeah. or the uh, what they call the startle position where everything is drawn up and bound up. So everything gets shorter. Uh and tighter and, and and it does it is harder to access those muscles or or to lengthen them at all because everything in the backside nothing needs to work because it's not being there we're not asking anything of those muscles anyway yeah um but i will i definitely know what you're talking about as far as the power pose position just opening things up that position alone is is extremely like i've, I've tested it uh, as just as a reset for just the nervous system likes that position yeah. So if you're standing in a power pose position and everything's just, you know, where it needs to be, erect, open, whatever, uh, 
breathing with a the diaphragm there, doing head nods there is incredibly powerful. Yeah, because you're open. Again, it's a very, very simplistic way of seeing it, but it is literally, it's, it's the spirit, the soul, the body, the physical body being open versus it being closed. And being open is to embrace life, to love life, to, to love others, to, to basically to accept. You know, that's opening up like that. I saying I accept. I accept I love, you know, because acceptance is love. Accepting everything as it is, is loving it. Um, versus closing in is, is doing the exact opposite. And when you, there's something about when you rest, when you sit at 90 degrees and you rest directly upon, I mean, obviously the glutes, you know, the glutes being a big part of who we are as a physical body. You know, our glutes are very, very different to any other animal because we walk upright. Um, you know, when we, we can talk the nugal ligament, we can talk the Achilles and we can talk the glutes. Those three things are very, very profound parts of being human in terms of our movement, aren't they? I, I don't know if you noticed this, but while glutes are supposed to be a really big part of being human, there are a lot of people that don't necessarily have glutes anymore. No. At all. Uh, like, yes. Yeah. And if they do have them, they're actually not where they belong. It seems like they're up higher in the middle of their back versus yes. down on the, you know, on their backside or, or of their hips where they belong. It's almost as if they shift position of where they're, something else has had to become the glutes higher up on the back. You know why that happens, don't you? I know you know this already. You sit on a sofa and slide down slightly so that instead of your, I mean, obviously sitting in a sofa, not ideal anyway, but if you were to sit at proper 90 degrees with your, your butt shifted back, so you were straight back to glutes there, but no, people are slid forward. So the glutes are literally sitting on a, they're, they're, they're becoming part of the legs almost. Um, obviously they are, but you know what I mean. And the, the glutes are literally shifting up because it, that location where the glutes should be, that, that junction of the seat, yeah, they, they are literally being, this is, you know, we're, we're losing our little toes. That was another, I remember there was a, a big study done on that a few years ago, how we are, because we're squashing our feet into, you know, compressed toe boxes, the little toes becoming less and less used and obviously if we don't lose something we don't just lose its function eventually we lose it altogether you know it's just a how far down that line do you want to go right, right. um so in terms of uh, going back to what you you asked in terms of like how does it i mean it is it is a literal expression it, it is a literal opening versus a closing of who we are and when again it's never about just one muscle or one part but it is very interesting that the part that you feel when you know where the gracilis is and you sit down on a chair, you go, yeah, you can very, very distinctly feel that that is, it kind of becomes, it feels vacant. It's almost like there's nothing there because it's completely been deactivated. Now, you deactivate a muscle that is very important in its role, okay, within the whole scheme of things, of giving us that thrust, which is a literal love for life. And as you know, when you've done the power pose, you are operating the gracilis there. When you bring the hips forward, the gracilis is playing a role there. And like anything, when you take a link out of the chain, it has, it has a big impact. Um, and this applies across the board. You know, if you want to be strong of mind, be strong of body. And, with, you know, we're talking reflexive strength. Um, you want to be agile of mind, be agile of body. And again, it's not just about simple agility tests. It's about true agility. The actual composition of this physical matter, being able to move really freely um and you're under control so it's yeah it, it just runs so deep it's like ma mastery i don't like the word mastery but mastery of the body is mastery of the mind but we don't i'm sorry no go on no i've, I've always known that i mean and, and we all know it um like we you know how you know things but you don't necessarily dive deep into how you know them or whatever but i think everybody knows the better they move the better they feel so and i've always known like well if i move really well i just feel really good but i've never equated that to the qualities of movement to the qualities of thought or the qualities of mind like like having good agility physically leading to good mental agility or having good physical strength leading to good mental strength. I don't know that I've ever equated the, I, I just knew move well, feel good <laughs> or, or be better. You know, your, your mind just, your mind's more clear, it's more crisp. Uh, you can focus better and you just have a better uh, countenance or better control of your emotions. And that, that's it right there. 
it's just another way of explaining it. You, you feel better. What is feeling better? F- feeling better is, is a number of things. It's chemical. It's energetic. Being able to deal with situations more, um, more appropriately and more easily. Now, why are you dealing with that situation more easily? Because you're potentially more agile of mind. Or it depends on the situation, you know. Um, are you able to make a decision between that? Or why are you able to make a decision more easily than someone else? I am fascinated by how you brought this up as far as having more balance or more stability leads to mm. more more stability in mind. So that's something I think would be worth playing with uh, just just to explore. You know, that's the big one. You know, if you could just keep a little log of of like daily balance or agil- uh, balance training on a board or some 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 type of balance challenge, but then also yeah. be a very aware of of your mindset you know throughout the days or weeks as you were doing that i've done it with myself and i've done it with a couple of other guys and both of them yeah dramatic changes within three or four days because if you pick if you pick the right exercises you know if, if you if you stand on one leg and raise your other leg behind you straight out and your body straight in front so kind of making a t-shape as best you can i mean obviously to one degree or another you'll feel plenty going on in that top of the thigh gracilis all, all around that region there right. they have to become right. stable and the changes are so rapid, so significant, because so many people are lacking that there because most people do sit in chairs for significant periods of time or don't do anything that requires stability. Um, and the changes, that, yeah, I mean, I remember observing them in myself. I worked on the stability one for myself personally quite a long time ago, and it was it was dramatic. Um, it, re- it really was. Um, and, yeah, you can go out and try. And I always, once I've done something, I'll go and do a bit of study and go, is there anybody, has anybody ever looked into this? Or can I find something giving me a, you know, a really easy scientific explanation that I can then pass on? But there, you never really find one, but it, it's quite clear when you've done it. And then you also look at, you know, the more, we'll call them esoteric traditions from the, you know, things like yoga and stuff that it's, they talk about it just in their own way. Yeah, and it, and it makes sense. I mean, of course, if you change the physical composition of this virtual reality suit that we inhabit, this beautiful piece of technology, I'm not suggesting we're computers, but, you know, it is a beautiful piece of technology. Of course, you're going to feel different. You, you know you feel different. It's just, yeah, it's just breaking it down, isn't it? This It's just saying, yeah, if you want to be more stable, do some stability work and, and observe. If you're listening yes. right now, the challenge is for two weeks, practice balancing every day. Challenge your balance or your stability, and then also just take notice on how you mentally feel. That would be the challenge, and then everybody report back to us and let you let us know what what you discover. Cool. Cool. Right, so, so you've got stability in body, at least to stability in mind. Uh, keeping the gracilis healthy or the love muscle leads to more of a loving person. Yeah. Any other, any other areas of the body that you think like people should really know about that would lead to just better uh, well-being and or just better being itself. It's it's all of them, but I mean, we'll we'll pick a couple. I mean, you you've worked on them all. I mean, you know, I'm not telling you anything new here, but um, if we think of the hands, this is something that I know very briefly discussed with you earlier. When we talk about the idea of holding on to things, and and that runs deep because holding on to things goes as far as having any attachment to outcome. Now, that, that gets very kind of Taoist and the whole idea of not being attached to outcomes, even goes back to the Garden of Eden. Um, and I don't want to go to, you know, the, the knowledge of good and evil. Before we had knowledge of evil, you could see that as knowledge of a bad outcome because otherwise everything is a positive outcome or just an outcome, however you want to see it. So we hold on to a lot. And as in body and mind, we physically hold on to it. And if you can physically relinquish it, you mentally relinquish it. And again, I've seen this. I've, I've done a few things with other kind of friends recently, which simply involves releasing the hands. So, you know, for example, you can lie on your back and have your palms up as if you would in Savasana in yoga and just observe what happens to your hands. And you'll probably find that they curl up somewhat. To one degree or another, they won't go flat and open like that. They probably won't. Most people, I'd be very surprised if they did. And if you bring your awareness to that and to the forearms in particular, because obviously the forearm, the connection between the hands and the forearms, 
you will probably find a surprising amount of tension. And obviously we can we can play with this. We can kind of almost forcibly do stuff. So whether that be placing the hands flat on the floor and putting weights upon them, whether it be a press up a plank, whatever you want to, you know, you can do that and just observe and observe where the tension is. Because when you bring your conscious kind of awareness, whatever you want to call it, to physical sensation, it's curative because you're effectively recognizing that and sending resources there and the body recognizes it and it do all kinds of things, start to tremor, start to release that tension simply by you observing it. So, you know, we can, we can bring about sensations. Hence, that's what yoga is. You know, you, you basically twist until you feel stuff. And when you feel stuff, which is suboptimal composition within the physical matter, you observe it. And when you observe it, resources go there and mechanisms kick in to start fixing it, whether that's you smiling at it and it releases whatever. So if you line your back with your hands open and bring your awareness to them, you'll probably feel a fair bit of tension. Sit there with that. Imagine them glowing. Imagine them turning into melted ice cream. Whatever you want to do. There's loads of things you can do visualization wise. But simply bring your awareness to them and you will start letting go of stuff mentally. And you, you'll notice it happen if you can, like you said, keep a record or even just be aware of how you feel. And you only need to do that for a brief period every day because you'll start to become more and more aware of it just from being aware of it. As with anything, when you become aware of it, you're now aware of that. That awareness never really goes away. It can get pushed back, but it's always there. It's just different levels of awareness, as with anything. So that's a huge one. And I mean, obviously, there's things you've talked about before that well, you talked about every body part uh, at some point. But the feet, you know, the feet in terms of stability are obviously huge. You know, you go go and stand one legged on a on a rough surface barefoot. Yeah, that'll make that'll heighten that that sensation of the balance even more. It's um it's free awareness, isn't it? If you go and stand on tarmac barefoot you don't have to bring any awareness to your foot it'll be there you know this is this is the thing you know we're all we're all the reason we have to be aware or we talk about awareness so much these days is because the main reasons we're not aware is because we're too busy and we're blocking sensations to everything in one way or another so whether that be drink drugs tv whatever you know to stop us actually sitting there and actually being aware of just being here or whether it be shoes or whatever, we, we've just all the stuff that would have just been there that we would have been aware of. We're not because we've blocked it. So or majorly distracted. Or majorly distracted, yeah. So it's not none of it's rocket science. It's very very straightforward. So you know, and one way of doing that obviously is movement, because when you move, if the system that you're moving, if the technology that you're moving around is not optimal the way that it's designed to be it'll let you know and if it doesn't let you know when you move a little bit you move a little bit more it might let you know now you know twist a bit further does it move now you know roll a little bit slower does it give you anything now oh yeah it did this time well you moved a little bit slower so you're more aware of it you gave it you know it's yeah you focus anywhere but um stability yeah I've come back to stability simply because it is the foundations of everything else you know, we see in the, you know, the so-called kind of spiritual world, if you like, people race ahead to become enlightened, as they call it. And they typically start at the heart. It's like, well, if you haven't built the foundations, you can do all the enlightening work you like from your heart up to your head and talk about enlightenment. And, you know, but if you haven't dealt with the stuff down below, it's all going to come crashing down. And this is this is seen, you know, this is seen throughout history that that's happened to countless people. And I'm not saying for one second I've got it now because, you know, uh, I, I'm not even on that quest. It just, just so happens I've come across that stuff as my on my own individual path. But, yeah, deal with the foundations first and then you might find the other stuff just starts to fall into place. Because once there's good foundations there, everything else becomes a little bit easier. And on that note, there's so many life lessons in that right there. <laughs> about starting with a good foundation and not starting at the top or not even starting at the middle. If you're listening, that's priceless. Start at the beginning, uh, which might just be with a breath <laughs> or simply lying down on the floor. But it leads to the top, which is, I guess, for depending on the person, is overall health, well-being, uh, could be could be spirituality, could be just calmness and emotions, could be clearness of thought or just simply feeling good. And I highly believe that everybody 
they may want a lot of things, but I think everybody wants to feel good, which to yeah. me just makes sense. And it's the best place to start because then all the other stuff has happened. If you feel good, I've made the argument that all the other stuff has happened. Yeah. Because yeah. what is it all about? If you feel good, well, how, how, what else is there? Well, if you, if feel you feel good in every moment. Yes. If you feel good, you're looking through the lens. How you see everything else is going to be through the lens of feeling good. Yeah. Or if you feel like trash, you're going to be looking through the lens of feeling like trash. And that's the knowledge of good and evil right there. Yeah. Because if you feel good, you see good. And if you feel yeah. bad, you see bad. Yeah. All right, guys. Hey, thanks so much for <laughs> this week's edition of the Original Strength Podcast. So lay that foundation and feel good. We'll see you next time. See ya. Thank you so much for listening to this edition of the Original Strength Podcast.